and Heather Pelzel, Associate Professor, Biology at UW-Whitewater. Thank you. So we'll each take our turns. The, the goal is for you to see us, hear us, and uh, hopefully eventually respond to us, right? So um, again, my name is Suzanne Treiber. I'm here from, um, from this locale, from Madison College. And what I'm sharing with you today is um, what I'm calling the L2 initiative that's been happening on our campus officially since 2017. Um, we have a, a group of cross-disciplinary faculty, staff, and students, and administrators who um, felt that uh, language, um, kind of going a little bit beyond race and ethnicity, looking at language and how language impacts our students and impacts our practices in connecting with our students. Um, so what I'm gonna be sharing with you is some of the work that we did in the last year and a half um, and also what we learned from those, um, from that action. But what I do also want to acknowledge is that um, our um, committee, we have an L2 advisory committee, like I said, and um, I did, I think some folks are still in here. Luz is still here. We, um, Mike has been part of our, um, our committee as well. So, um, so anyways, what I want to encourage everyone who's listening is that you can do this on your campus too, because it was basically a, um, a grassroots effort um, that did originate in the Writing Center, but is definitely beyond the Writing Center at this point. So um, our vision is that Madison College is a learning community that embraces and values linguistic diversity in higher education and beyond. So that's what we envision um, for our college, and that our mission is actually um, recognizing and supporting language identities on campus by providing resources that foster students' social and academic success. So we have a mission that will last far beyond me, but that's okay. Um, so our first effort is what I'm gonna be sharing with you, and that first effort was to build awareness and better understand linguistically diverse students um, one of the things that we started discovering um, at the ground level, particularly in writing centers, um, is that we had more and more students coming to us who are multilingual, whose first language is not English. Uh, a raise of hands of, of others who are experiencing more students with, with culturally, linguistically diverse backgrounds. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So um, we, uh, our writing center is, is structured for, that includes um, English faculty, and so a lot of what was happening among English faculty is they were particularly um, making those kinds of comments and observations. So we put some um, professional development and some training within the Writing Center to support our English faculty, and we said, well, why aren't we doing this on a broader scale? Um, so one of the reasons we weren't doing it on a broader scale is there isn't really any conversation happening around linguistic diversity on our campus. So that was really something we needed to do was to build that awareness. So what we decided to do was to study students from a linguistic lens. Okay, studying our own students. And you can do this too. Um, I would be happy to share the survey that we um, spent about eight months working on uh, and, and happily have you use that or tweak that to um, be more informed about your own students on your own campus. Um, what we looked at are a lot of things. We looked at students' education background. We looked at, of course, their, their language background, their aspirations. Um, and we particularly looked at their confidence in their um, in literacy skills and abilities. Uh, that includes what we call literacy domains. And those literacy domains are reading, writing, speaking, and listening. 
So that's where we ended up. We had a, a wealth of data. And again, reach out to me if you want more uh, detailed information I'd love to share. Um, but we focused our, um, our efforts on that confidence level. What are students actually feeling when they're in the classroom, when they're engaging in reading activities, speaking activities, reading activities, and writing, OK? So who we studied? Uh, we studied all students who were in, enrolled in an English course. Um, all students had access to the survey if they were enrolled in an English course in three different semesters. And based on some of the questions that we asked students, we started um, looking at different multilingual groups. Okay, so we started realizing that there were students who identified as speaking an, a language other than English. They acknowledged yes. I do. I speak, I'm fluent or I'm native to another language than English. We also had students who said, yeah, I, I speak another language at home. So some of our students don't, some of our students do, right? Especially our students who are living independently with roommates, maybe not. If they're still living at home, maybe they are, right? And then we also had this interesting group of students who identified saying, um, we asked them how fluent they were in English. And we had a group of students um, about 16% in all three semesters, I think one semester is 15, another was 17, 16%, who actually identified as being, le they said, I'm less than fluent in English. And these are all students taking academic, program level, college level courses. And they identify themselves as feeling less than fluent in English, okay? And then of course we also had students who took the survey who said, I only speak English. So we thought, well, let's look at comparing the confidence in students who are monolingual, that's our only speak English group, to all these three other groups. Um, the reason I have that little fun thing on the left is the next slide is gonna show you one piece of data that um, I'd like for you to see that's some pretty consistent with additional data, but so there I told you, it's all the pretty colors on the right side. So what we noticed or what we learned and you see I said learn so far, because this is a long-term um, effort, is that no matter what questions we asked students about their reading, writing, speaking, or listening skills, so we broke this down. So in this particular question, we asked them how confident are you in speaking? Just a general question, and on down the line. Then we um, asked them additional questions about speaking activities or abilities, right? How comfortable or how confident are you speaking in front of your classmates? How comfortable are you speaking with your instructor? So those, that piece, those data points are not included, but what we realized is that no matter what question we asked in terms of literacy skills, the multilingual student groups, all three, were always lower in confidence compared to our monolingual students always lower. And our um, group that identified as less than fluent in English, greatest gap. The good news was that despite this gap, we asked a question about, well, what do you want to, how far do you want to go in your um, educational uh, career? And that's when the data flipped. We had multilingual students more consistently saying they wanted to get a JD, an MD, a master's, right, than our monolingual group. So we know our students are motivated. That's cool. Motivated, not so much in the area of confidence compared to monolingual students. So this is also what we've learned. Again, this is, I feel like this is more like a spaceship um, view versus a bird's eye view, but um, some of the main things that we've learned also is very similar to what Running Horse had shared. We have diversity among our linguistically diverse students. So when you have one student who might be from the Gambia and you have another student who's from Korean or from Korea, you know that they're not necessarily the same. They have some similarities because they're not originally maybe from here, but we also know that these are the three primary elements that impact student engagement and development. 
And what can we do with what we've learned? I'm not going to read all of these. I'm just going to highlight them if you want to take a picture of what we've learned and what you can possibly incorporate into your classrooms. What I do want to share is the um, one thing to consider is learning about your students' ling linguistic backgrounds using a student profile questionnaire. And what I mean by that is I actually even just talked with a nursing student or a nursing instructor earlier in the week. And she said, oh, I already do that. I'll just modify and ask some language questions in that profile. I said, awesome, I'll send you mine. You can use some of those questions. So if you want, I have access, or I've created a student profile questionnaire that you are welcome to look at. But when you think about doing a profile questionnaire, think about the literacy demands in your classroom. What are you expecting in terms of participation for speaking? What are you um, expecting when it comes to writing and reading, okay? And ask questions to inform you of where they are and where they are not in terms of their confidence or their experience, to be perfectly honest. The other one that I wanted to highlight is more towards the bottom, is at the bottom here about um, creating assignments or classroom experiences um, that reveal students' language and cultural backgrounds. When we are informed about our students' language backgrounds, we can incorporate more experiences in our classrooms. It doesn't have to be a lot. When students realize that they're part of the classroom, there will be more engagement and there will be more participation. Um, and an acknowledgement of culture and an acknowledgement of language reinforces the fact that they feel they can be there. Okay. Hello again, everyone. So I introduced myself a little bit already. There we go, shorter. Um, but kind of like Gloria did earlier, I wanted to give you just a little bit of my own background so you could understand how I got to where I am now and, and why I do what I do the way I do it. Um, and so my Teaching background started as a grad student. I was part of the Wisconsin Scientific Teaching Program at Madison, which gave me the opportunity in a STEM field, I should say that part. I'm a biologist. Right? Um, so any of you STEM folks in the, in the audience know as a grad student, you get like this much training in how to be a good teacher, right? Unless you actively go out and find it. And so that was me. I actively went out and found it because I knew that I wanted to end up at a primary teaching institution. So I did that program and it introduced me to all kinds of great things like how to design your course, <laughs> how to use active learning and, and good things like that. Um, and then I got into the classroom, right? And I actually got to practice it. And I actually, nod to Catherine, right? I started at Beloit College also. I was there for a year and a half before I, I moved to Whitewater. And I've been at Whitewater now for nine years. Um, apart from that kind of on the job, training, right? I really like being a student is what I figured out. And so I am always going to different workshops and things, trying to learn more. Um, and some of them, you know, at the bottom there, there's lots of whitewater programs and system programs. And I mean, the National Association of Biology Teachers, but those two at the top are two initiatives that really had a, a big impact on, on how I teach my classes. Sensor is an acronym. Stands for Science Education for New Civic Engagements and Responsibilities, which is a big long thing, right? Uh, it's about using real world issues and, and getting your students involved and civically engaged with their content. Um, so getting them to the content through the context. Um, and CREATE is also an acronym that I'm not gonna run through, it's even bigger. Um, but what it involves is using primary literature to teach students how to think critically and creatively about science, which is not something they, they don't always put science and creative together in the same sentence. Um, so that's kind of a little bit of my background. And oh, I almost forgot my title at the top, right? Um, where I'm going with this is to tell you about my own experience in the classroom and how I've used relationship building and in creating a sense of community within my classroom to try to um, increase our sense of belonging, which I found also maybe decreases our equity gap in my classes just a little bit. 
and they do most of it through the use of uh, a couple different high impact practices. Um, so I have like kind of three key takeaways, right? A slide for each. My first one is start by trusting students, right? Um, and this sounds easy, it's simple, right? Except in practice, sometimes it's a little bit harder to do. Um, but when I try, I do trust my students, but I have to convince the students that I trust them. Sometimes they think I'm just tricking them. Um, but so when I, when I start the semester, it all starts at the beginning a lot, right? I try to convey this to students by talking a lot and being very explicit and transparent about why I've designed the class the way I have um, or why we're using different formats. Um, doing a lot of, uh, with some background in educational research, I'll try new things and I'll ask them to do assessments and surveys. And so I'm always trying to really be clear about why I'm doing that. Along with trusting students, something um, that has been mentioned a couple times today, right, is that our students are people, right? They're not just a number or a, a face in our classroom. And so I try to remember that and incorporate as much flexibility as I can on things like attendance and deadlines, right? I don't know if she's still here, but the person earlier who talked about students getting class 10 minutes late and not being able to get in because the door's locked, right? And we know that there's lots of reasons students get to class late, and some of them might just be because they decided to hit snooze on their alarm too many times, but some of them might be um, because they were dropping their kids off or they couldn't find a parking spot or a whole host of other things, right? Um, so trying to make sure that I'm removing as many of those roadblocks as I can. Uh, I use one of the high impact practices that I use in my class is collaborative learning. My, one of my classes is an entirely team-based learning. And so we talk a lot about group dynamics and responsibilities um, and what that means in our classroom. And, and um, I think that shows them that I'm trusting them to make decisions within their group, but it also get, starts to get them to trust each other. And I actually use the word trust with them a lot. You have to trust your teammates and show them your vulnerability to say, I don't understand this. And if you understand it, you also have to trust your classmates to not pick on you for being like, oh, you're so smart, right? Um, because we know there's vulnerability on both sides. Um, and when possible, I give them some place to decide on content or assignments, coming back to that, um, using real world issues, right? And we can pick the issues we think are cool uh, or interesting or whatever, but that doesn't always hit the mark with our students, right? They might think something different is, is really great. And so trying to give them the options to make those choices when I can, which actually to refer to one of my pictures, so that one on the end there where there's a bunch of bananas, right? Um, the other things you can't see around that table are piles and piles of condoms. Um, so my students chose one semester, their focus in microbiology was gonna be sexually transmitted diseases. And I said, okay, let's do this, right? Um, <laughs> And so we had our college health assessment data and they worked through it and they were looking, I, I gave them the charge to, to find where we have issues on our campus with sexual health. And so they did. Um, and one of the groups, well, a couple of them, but one of them in particular really focused in on condom usage. They're like, do you know that not everybody uses a condom every time? And I said, yes. <laughs> <Right>. um, <laughs> and so, uh, they decided, uh, so, and I, I like to try to get my students out of the classroom as much as possible when I can. And so this group actually developed a whole independent study where they uh, built this survey and they decided to, to do an intervention because they found data from elsewhere, right? Not Whitewater, although I'm sure it's relevant. Um, that not only do college students not use a condom every time, but they don't even know how to use a condom appropriately. And so that's what they decided to tackle. Hence, a table full of bananas and condoms in the atrium of the science building, right? Um, and our building manager, who's one of my colleagues in the biology department, came to me and he's like, do you know about this? <laughs> and I said, yep, yeah, they're good. Um, so trust your students, right, that they're, they're gonna get there. Uh, get to know each other, right? This is so simple, like these are the basics, right? But sometimes we kind of forget about some of them. And so, uh, learn names, right? How many times have you been told that? Learn your students' names, it makes a difference. And I understand that that's a lot easier in a class of 15 or 30 than it is in a class of two or 300, 
right? Um, but doing the best you can, whether you need name tags or table tents or whatever it is. Um, another way I get to use my learn my or blah, get to know my students right away is with this I am list. So I started using this a couple years ago. This is one of my first day of class slides, right? I am, um, and this is this is my list from this year. I switch it up a little bit, um, but. So it tells them a whole bunch of things about myself and I read through it and I kind of elaborate on a few points as I go just to try to build some connections. And then I ask them to create their own I am list, right? And to tell me 10 things about themselves. And I don't make them read it out loud. They don't have to share it with anybody except for me. They have to give it to me. Um, and then I read through them so that I can learn a little bit more about them. Um, but then it's not just that. Right? If we go on the fourth point, it's to talk about them, talk with them about what they tell you. And that doesn't necessarily mean I schedule like a one-on-one -on -one meeting with each of them. But I might notice that um, one of them told me they're a big Blackhawks fan, right? And so when hockey season starts, or if I happen to notice there's a game, I can be like, hey, did you watch that Blackhawks game last night? I know zip about hockey, right? But um, just remembering some of that, they'll tell me they're in sports, they'll tell me about their families, they'll tell me about their jobs, um, they'll tell me about why they think this semester is gonna suck so bad and they wish they didn't have to take my class, right? Um, they tell me all kinds of things, but it helps me get to know them a little bit. Uh, one way I try to encourage them to get to know me and for me to get to know them a little better is also to encourage more office visits and to incentivize them. So for some of my classes, I give a take-home exam and it's a group exam actually, could be easier, right? Um, but I tell them if they come to my office before it's due with their group or at least part of their group, right? I'll go through the answers with them and, and when they do this, they found that they get like almost perfect scores on the take-home exam, it's an amazing thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what they don't realize is that oftentimes, you know, a couple of them will get there and we'll be mating, ma waiting for one group member or another and I'll be like, how's it going? Right? What you got going on this week? Lots of exams. And they start talking, right? And then I can get to know a little bit more about them. Um, and if they come into my office, they know more about me because I have things in my office, right? Things about me. I have family pictures and my Bucky Badger head stuck on the wall and all kinds of stuff around so that they can start to get more clues about who I am too. Uh, and interacting outside of the classroom. So this time <laughs> the picture on the far right there with that cheery looking group in the snow, right? I took my class out on a soil collection trip in February in Wisconsin. <laughs> that was them. They look pretty happy for it at the moment, right? Um, they didn't, I, I told them to dress appropriately and I think some of them didn't really believe me that we were going to go on a hike, um, but we did and it was good. Um, and you get to know a lot about them when you take them on a hike in February. <laughs> right. um, this is another idea that has come up a few times today, so I'm not, not giving you anything new, right? But maybe sharing a few ways that I do this. So we talk about giving everyone a voice in class, right? Whether it's not calling on the first hand raised, right? Or allowing written responses. Those are both things that I do too. Um, alternating the roles, right? Running Horse talked about that. Assigning the roles and asking them to stick to them and changing that role in different class periods, right? Allowing some time for thinking and maybe writing, right? One idea that came up one time because I had in my lab class, they work in groups, right? White water is, we have, white water is white, right? We already acknowledge that, that Wisconsin is predominantly white students. Um, and white water is no different. And in this one particular class, I had one student of color, one, right? And she came to me after a class, and in her group of four, she told me that she was feeling ignored, right? They were working on a group project, and she said she was trying to share her ideas, and she didn't feel like her group was listening to her. And she said, she's like, I don't know what you can do about it, but that's how I'm feeling. I said, okay, let me think on that and see what we can do. So the next week we came back to class, we did one of these round robin rights, right? Where I said, I had everybody get out a piece of paper and I said, all right, we've talked about all different kinds of ideas for these group projects, right? I want each of you to write down your favorite idea, right? What's your favorite topic for this project? And they did it. 
And I said, okay, pass it to the person on your right, in your group, right? I said, okay, now read what the person before you wrote and then add something to it, right? Comment, respond to that person's suggestion. And we went around the whole group like that, right? So it was just four turns. It only took about 10 minutes um, so that everybody in the group got to get their idea out there and everybody in the group read everybody else's idea and then they had a conversation about what their group was gonna work on. Um, and did they choose her idea? I don't know. I don't know if they chose her idea, but I talked to her again after it and I said, what do you think? Did, do you think it helped at all? She's like, it was great. She's like, they all responded to my idea and I got to respond to theirs before we started our discussion. Like, perfect, right? So doing anything you can to give everyone a voice. Um, encouraging contributions, again, right? It comes back to trust and broadening their audience anytime you can. And so that's a um, bunch of the pictures are up here, right? in trying to give them a broader audience. Those are some of my research students. The ones at the bottom are at a regional honor society meeting. They had done a, a research project and they got to go give their presentation, right? The ones on the, the far right and the one up above, those were the same meeting, if anybody's familiar with Tiny Earth. It's a antibiotic search. Um, but the National Symposium is in Madison. It's really affordable. And I actually do the project in my micro class. So these weren't students that had to do anything beyond their classwork to be able to go to this national meeting and present their work, right? So they created their posters, posters, right? I'm with Gloria, they're an underutilized resource. Um, they created the research posters as the end product of their class lab. And then they took those posters to this national symposium if they wanted to. Um, they didn't have to, it was optional, right? And I keep joking that everybody's gonna start thinking Whitewater is like an all-female school because that's who I took with me. But um, there were guys in the class, they just didn't go. So giving everyone a voice in the class. Now, uh, coming back to, I mentioned that I use a lot of high impact practices to do some of these things. And so I mentioned the collaborative learning, the undergrad research, um, that hike that we went on the hoods, woods in. Um, that was actually a, a community-based learning project that we still do with the Ice Age Trail Alliance around Whitewater, where we work with them. One of the one or two of the Alliance members goes out with us and gives us some background about the Ice Age Trail and leads us on the hike. This fall when we went out, it was actually a working hike, and so we did brush clearing and um, sign painting and stuff while we were out there. So we try to do it um, on both sides. So a a couple different high impact practices that I use. And when we think about high impact practices, one of the conversations we've been having at, in, within the UW system is how do we make these equitable, right? Because we know that oftentimes some students get a lot of access to them and some get none. And so for my own classes, when I've uh, added these experiences to my classes or to my independent research stuff, uh, the things I'm trying to consider are, does it require extra time? Right, and so I mentioned that being able to go to that symposium, of course the symposium itself was extra time, but the work they had to do to get there was just part of their work they were doing in the class for credit, right? So it wasn't an extra thing they had to add on to their already busy schedules. Um, does it require extra money, right? And this could be um, money in terms of credits, right? So if they wanna do like summer undergraduate research, that's money for credits. It could be travel, so for that, the Tiny Earth one, it's right here in Madison, it's really cheap, but I got our biology department to pay for all of them so that um, they didn't have to pay anything. I even gave them an option to all carpool with me or with each other to get up here, so really, um, it cost them a couple days out of their lives and, and that was it, the rest was covered. Um, same with some other community-based learning project I've tried to find is, can we bring the project to them on campus so that they also don't have to travel somewhere? Can we build it into class time so they're not working on it, you know, when they also have to be taking care of their kids or working at their job um, because they're all doing those things also. And the last bit on the equitable access that I always try to keep in mind is, do they need to know how to navigate the system? And this is something our table talked about earlier because there are those students that know how to find those opportunities and how to take advantage of them and they know who they're supposed to talk to and the forms they have to fill out. And there are other students 
um, like me when I got to college as a first generation student, right, who has no idea what's going on, right? You know you have to take your classes and you go through it and you get the end and other students are talking about these amazing things they did and you're like, I didn't even know that was an option, right? And so I've been trying to build in opportunities with my classes um, as much as I can that are just required parts of our curriculum so that they don't have to know how to navigate the system to get those opportunities. They're just there. Right? So that is, that's it for me. Hi everyone, thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here today, so thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me, um, and thanks for staying. Uh, so uh, following Heather's lead here, I am. Um, I work at Beloit College, it's Catherine Orr. I was hired 21 years ago as a women's studies professor. Um, full FTE in women's studies as a small liberal arts college was kind of a, like a unicorn at the time. Um, and since then, um, my uh, program and then department has become um, women's and gender studies, but then in 2013, uh, we became critical identity studies. And the reason for that is because race was nowhere else in the curriculum. We did not have ethnic studies, no black studies um, at Beloit College, despite perennial calls from students since 1969. So, um, so I decided it was going to be my program. and. Uh, so one of the things that critical identity studies is and does, and by the way, I think I'm still the only critical identity studies department in the nation, although I'm lobbying for, for more, um, is the, we, we use women of color feminisms and we make intersectionality the floor, not the ceiling of every single class we teach. And that means not just one, a single axis of identity, but we're always thinking about um, gender, race, class, um, sexuality, um, disability and post-colonial takes on identities. Um, so I also, when I was invited here, talked, you know, I, I kind of didn't know why I was invited here because there's another part of my volunteer life. I, I, um, I live in Monona and in Madison, I run and co-facilitate a witnessing whiteness workshop for K through 12 um, teachers, staff, and parents. And that's kind of like my, um, my, my sort of, uh, the life I have in Beloit where, or, or sorry, in Madison where I sort of do my thing on identity, but just kind of in a different context. But for today, I thought what might be most appropriate to think about for this audience was um, a project that I'm a co-PI on, and it's called the um, Mellon Decolonizing Pedagogies Project. Now, Mellon gave us some money, about $600,000, over the course of three years to think hard about how to build equity um, into the culture, operations, curriculum, and pedagogy of Beloit College writ large. Um, and these were our questions that we asked, right? How do we create inclusive classroom spaces? What does equity look like at a primarily white um, institution? How does one enact institutional transformation so that underserved and underrepresented students, faculty, and staff feel like they belong at these predominantly historically white colleges? Um, we wanted to do more than tips and tricks, um, and so we went big and aspirational, thus the decolonizing in the name, right? Decolonizing is huge. I mean, one might say that institutions themselves cannot be decolonized, right, just on the basis of, of them being institutions um, in this United States. But um, we wanted to go beyond tips, tricks, content, right, because how would content like read this article or something like that work in a chem classroom or a physics classroom. Um, we wanted to be more foundational and ask faculty and staff about who they are in the room um, and, and how their disciplinary training uh, makes space or not for marginalized bodies that might enter those spaces. We wanted to think hard with our colleagues about the colonizing legacies of colleges and universities um, more broadly, and we wanted to imagine how any space on campus uh, would look or feel if black, feminist, indigenous, queer perspectives were centered and whiteness was decentered. Right? So we were asking a lot of our folks. Um, so just want to tell you a little bit about the structure. The structure of this program, we basically had this foundational reading series that everyone 
um, went through who wanted to join. Um, not everyone took it, um, but we did have a pretty significant numbers. Um, it's kind of this developmental arc. So this foundational reading series, a semester long, six 90 minute meetings, readings every time, reflection every time, right, in terms of a written reflection. Uh, we were really looking at origin stories of our disciplines um, and ways in which academia, um, universities, um, knowledge production in the West goes back to these subject-object relations built in colonizing legacies, right? So no one's innocent, right? So we're, we're trying to sort of think hard about what does it mean to do what we do um, in terms of, you know, a, a, a country built uh, by stolen people on stolen land. Right? I mean, get to those questions that were super hard for some folks in the room. Um, every session had two facilitators. We were multiracial, one white, um, one a person of color. And basically, we asked fac faculty and staff to see both their discipline um, in terms of the way it centers whiteness and how might they think about decentering whiteness. Um, so that was the foundational reading series. So folks went through that, and if they went through that, then they could go on to the curriculum workshop and peer coaching. Um, and that was like a three-day summer thing, two days that right after graduation, and then reconvening back in August after they did um, a bunch of work. Um, that was time, support, um, and expertise to overhaul some basic structure of what they do, right? Obviously for faculty that would be a course or part of a course, but there were offices and programs that came in and thought about what it was they did that was basically, you know, sort of not in line with the equity that they claimed to believe in. So this was their chance to think about how to do something foundational. Um, participants could create some concrete and measurable action um, action plans, excuse me, that culminate in some substantive change in the, how they approach their work. And then they're what we were called RATS, Research Action Teams. <laughs> and this is where students came in. Uh, so Mellon is really big on faculty development and some staff development, not so big on students, but we wanted to be uh, involve students somehow. So the research action teams were someone, a staff person or uh, a faculty person gathered a group of students and for eight months across uh, the span of two semesters, right, tried to work on some research, um, uh, in research based intervention into the college um, culture. Um, some campus practice, something that, you know, had something to do with how it is that marginalized bodies encountered campus in ways that um, white bodies didn't necessarily. So, outcomes. Um, by the numbers, I'll say 120 college faculty and staff have completed it over the course of three years. Um, and we're, we're a campus, small campus, right, 1,200 students, so we only have about 280 employees, right? So 120 people can create some critical mass when you all go through the same program, right? Um, so, uh, so the numbers are, are, you know, you see the numbers there in terms of how many people went through the curriculum workshop and research action teams. And some examples of projects, right, um, in terms of what Heather was just talking about, um, we had a group of scientists because we recruited scientists first um, when we started these um, started our uh, reading groups. Um, some a couple of people just ran with it, and one of our a couple of our folks did rethinking the leaky pipeline and really trying to think about um, group work in science classes, right? If you're in science class, you know it's a lot of group work. We just heard about some methods, right? But one of the things our, our folks were finding is that in those groups in science classes is where microaggressions occurred, right? And that was where, you know, this is how the science center, you know, stays so white, right? Um, is because the pipe, you know, the leaky pipeline, we know that metaphor. Um, so that was a project, right? Um, another project was in our career development office. You know, it's kind of like one of those moments when you see someone's eyes just sort of get it, right? Our career development director was in one of our reading groups and basically said, I'm teaching our, you know, students of color, our trans students, our queer students, um, basically how to uh, adapt themselves to white, middle class, heteronormative culture when they go out for job interviews. Right? I mean, it is that, is that the mission that I should be, I should be all about? Right? And it's not like we don't want our students to go out and succeed in those job interviews, but can we approach it in a way that's accounting for the differences that, that you know, come through the door? Um, another one, uh, another uh, research action team that we did, and that was the first year, was actually Cultures of Whiteness at Beloit 
where uh, students went out and, and sort of surveyed all kinds of ways in which buildings and statues and archives and all kinds of things sort of um, were sort of centered on whiteness and what it might look like if whiteness was decentered in some kind of way. So they researched all kinds of things that might name buildings differently and things like that. So, um, so that just gives you a sense of, of what it is. Now, um, what we were telling Mellon is that the curriculum, operations, pedagogy, and culture, right, uh, we wanted to shift it. We wanted sort of some institutional transformation. And at the start of our program, I'd say that many of our participants um, expressed that they can't or don't lead, right? I mean, a lot of folks was like, great idea, wow, this is amazing, what we're talking about in here, but I have no power, right? I can't change things, the way we do things around here. And I'm saying this even in a semester where we had administration in the room, right? We don't have the power, we can't change, we just, we, the way we do things around here, people will revolt, people will resist. Right? And I think one of the things that we really walked away with, and it's not like we knew it at the beginning, but we kind of came to it afterwards, is that we really challenged them to understand that leadership and power are not the same. And that every interaction with a student, every meeting, every anytime you're sitting at the back of the meeting or you're leading a meeting is an opportunity to lead on equity. It's a chance to intervene. It's a chance to ask a question that tries to get folks um, to, to rethink the business as usual that might be perpetuating the culture of our college, right? So um, change is hard, right? And conflict, anxieties, right? Um, when you ask people to change, right? I mean, people love change. They want change. But say, change yourself? Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> right? I've got my attachments, I've got my things, I've got, I've got things that I've invested myself in. And that becomes super hard. Right? And so there's been backlash. And there has been um, anxiety and, you know, people pitting, uh, people feeling pitted against each other. Especially when we didn't make our class and, you know, the budget shortfall hit and there was a lot of finger pointing. Right? And one of the, a lot of fingers came at us right, for creating a conflict, right, that was making people feel uncomfortable. Um, so equity work is not comfortable work, right, and it's especially not comfortable for white people. So um, where we are now, we are now in um, the fourth year of our three-year <laughs> grant, um, because we did have some money left over, right? And so we're actually embracing that conflict and we're trying to think hard about what it means to transform conflict into catalysts, right? There's all kinds of literature out here, um, um, out there, right, um, uh, about this. And it's not literature that I know, this is not my field of expertise, it's like we're, you know, seat of the pants, like um, building the plane as we fly it kind of thing. Um, but in year four, we've d done what we've called a community transformation workshop. And this work comes um, out of uh, David Anderson Hooker, who um, is uh, at um, uh, uh, where, where, the, the, the Irish College, Indiana. Notre, Notre Dame, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> it's that middle age thing, right? <laughs> I know everything about it, but the name. Um, an amazing educator, right? Um, PhD, JD, MDiv thinks a lot about conflict and has been a mediator in conflicts all over the world. Anyways, he's written this little book, as you see, of transformative community conferencing. We had him come in just this semester. And conflict in a, in a lot of ways, and this is you know, one of his ideas, conflict is about hunkering down in our attachments, like what it is we're attached to, and turning, you know, turning um, those who we disagree with into the them. You know, there's the us, and there's the them, and we're on the side of the right and the righteous, and those folks are making it hard, and we're just trying to you know, follow through on the mission of the college, and he's like, oh no, that ain't gonna work, right? I mean, one of the things that he sort of left us with was this question, about what are each of us willing to give up about who we think we are, right, in order to get the community that we want. Because he kind of looked around the room at all of us and said, you know who you are now, right? That's not going to work in the future that you want. So what are you going to give up, right? And for a lot of us, that's an attachment to righteousness. For a lot of us, that's anger. Right? For a lot of us, that's like not humanizing the people that we're disagreeing with. Right? It doesn't mean that we give up our beliefs, but it does mean something about trying to come together as a community after right, we've demanded change and done some real change, critical mass kind of change 
in equity. So that's where we are now, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. My gosh, I don't feel like I can say anything else after that. Very inspiring. Thank you so much uh, to the three of you for being here with us today and sharing your expertise and some of the challenges, some of the struggles, but also some of the successes, right? Um, if you have questions for these three um, wonderful folks, come on up after and ask them. We do want to get you out on time. So just a couple summary statements and reminders for the end of our day today. First of all, thank you for all being here. What a great day, great discussion and conversation and, and really embracing that and digging into some of those hard conversations. So thank you all so much for that. Uh, it's time to go back and continue the work back at your college, and we do have some subgrants that can help you to do that. So we did send out an email to everyone who registered with information about those subgrants. Um, we're looking at continuation of this work, and we're calling those implementation subgrants. Uh, email went out on this past Tuesday on the 3rd. So if you missed that, you can go back and take a look at that. The application deadline is December 16th. So that's coming up pretty quick. Uh, we're trying to get this money out the door and out to do some type of project at your college, in your classroom, a takeaway from today. So the applicants will be notified end of December and we'll have six different subgrants, $500 each. So take a look at that email with those details and consider whether that might be something helpful. Also, we'd encourage you to connect with other folks at your college who are participating in some of this work, or engaging in some of this work to see how you might be able to partner. So go for that. Um, of course, we really want you to complete the evaluation. That's coming out. It came out in an email today also, the evaluation link. So please do that. And um, we definitely want you to take a look at the resources that will be out on that 60 Forward site. So you will get a couple follow-up emails. Um, the resources will be on that 60 Forward site. The recordings will be out on the 60 Forward site um, after those are completed. So that's going to take a little bit more time. Um, we'll get all the presentations out there as well. So we hope from this day that you've had a chance to reflect and consider how you want to move forward in your own in your own work, in your own development, and thinking about your own biases and how you can help to move the needle so that all of us together are continuing to move the needle towards more equitable experiences for all of our st students. So looking forward to everybody um, having some of our joint experiences today, moving some of that collaboration forward, and safe travels home. So thank you so much for being here. <laughs>